Sweatpixel Live. My name is Adam Hanlon, I'm the editor of Pixel, and I'd like to thank Backscatter and Auto Photo and Video for sponsoring this episode. Backscatter offer a wide range of, of videography and photography equipment, um, and please check them out at backscatter.com. I'm thrilled to introduce Natalie Gibb today. Hi, Natalie. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, Natalie is based in Tulum in uh, Mexico. Um, and is the owner of um, a primarily a, a cave diving business called Under the Jungle. Um, but Natalie's a very, very accomplished cave explorer um, and produces beautiful cave imagery as well. So, so we're very lucky to have her along to tell us a little bit about how what she gets up to and, and how she captures these beautiful images. So I guess that's a good place to start, Natalie. Um, how do you go about setting up a shoot in the caves? What do you What do you do? What's the first thing you do? So I would say the first thing that happens is I choose a place. Usually, I'm choosing a place I'm familiar with, yeah. or um, that I've been diving at least once or twice before. I'll have some concept of like an area that I thought was an interesting place to shoot. And sometimes I'll have a concept of like, oh, I want to shoot like a canyon or I want to shoot a whatever, a, a nice flat bedding thing, for example, or some sand dunes. But a lot of the time I'll just go in with this kind of open idea of I want to shoot this really pretty area. And then um, as I work with the lights and where I can place them and such, the photos sort of develops as I go while I'm creating it. So, so just to put some respect to Natalie, how many dives have you got in the caves around the Yucatan, roughly? You, I, I would estimate I have between seven and 9,000 cave dives, and probably each cave dive is averaging around two hours long. So, I mean, that's that's a really, I mean, obviously from that, you've obviously had a look around, you know what's going to work. So, so I guess the first thing is you've got a bunch of local knowledge. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good place to start. I, I, am I right in saying that? Absolutely. I don't think a person can be successful in cave photography or videography without at least a good knowledge of the site that they're diving in. And sometimes all it takes is, you know, a dive as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, to at least familiarize yourself with the place before you shoot it. And I guess also, I mean, given particularly the ones that have ambient light, you want to be looking at times of day and stuff like that as well? Times of day are important and uh, also seasons, because of course the angle of the light will change in different seasons of the year. So, uh, for example, the pit, which is a really famous site, has this beautiful light beam that goes down 40 meters. It might have the light beam at one angle during the winter and a different angle during the summer. So if you want that shot where it goes straight down the middle of the of the tunnel, you need to have it be shot in the summer. Right. So you gotta you gotta plan when you go and what time of day. So yeah, yeah, really important. Absolutely. Um, and and so when when you um so you mentioned before you set up your lighting. So so how's your lighting set up for these pictures, Natalie? Yeah, I mean, in general terms, obviously you can't do it specifically, but so where where do you strobe lights? Where are they? How do you how do you put them out? So um, I in any of my photos or videos when I'm setting a scene, I probably have between five and nine lights set up. And uh, my favorite lights are the Kelvin 8000 lumen lights. I have that have the, they're the Luna ones that have the nice yeah. domes on them. Yeah. Um, so that really helps because it's a nice drop off and they're the strongest I use. So I put those farther back. I try to do a good job of hiding them. So I'll run around and set the scene and do some general lighting with the Kelvins. And then after that, once I kind of have a concept of like, hey, the background and things are lit, then I'll move around with some smaller lights and fill in dark spaces or place the light so that uh, uh, the model will be illuminated as well. Okay. And I mean, obviously, this is, involves moving around the cave. So, so, so for a lot of people, that in itself is a pretty extreme activity. Um, how do you, uh, well, how do you maintain awareness of, of the guideline, you know, where you are, everything else? I mean, obviously, this is, that's a big question. I understand that. But, but I mean, I, I guess it's a really important part of it. Maybe that's a better way of describing it. Um, how, how do you do that? Yeah. You must be really careful. 
Yeah, you, you have to be really careful. Um, the first thing I do is I always have the model on the line. So the model stays on the line. I don't care if there's something really pretty. You go shoot away from the line. I'll light that up in the background. Model's on the line, so the model is safe. And then I place a cave marker, which is like a plastic triangle, on the line, pointing towards the exit, so nobody can become confused uh, as to which way is out. And so then the model, in many ways, sort of becomes my reference. But I don't shoot in places that are silty or that I'm unfamiliar with. So just like if I look up, I have a concept of where I am immediately and I'm not disoriented. I um, always have an idea of the compass heading out, et cetera, as well. It's really helpful. Yeah. So so I think important to stress for people watching this, you know, if you want to shoot in these environments, um, you know, there's there's various different um degrees that you you are qualified to enter into case depending on your qualification level it's very important that you do this within whatever your qualification level and experience level probably more importantly um is you know it's, it, these these are are very challenging environments to shoot in so you're underwater natalie it's dark okay how do you work mm -hmm. your camera controls and um, you know how do you you mentioned setting a scene up obviously you're now well how do you do that i mean what do you do because you it's dark yeah, so uh, I guess that was never a consideration for me. Uh, I still feel like I'm a, I guess I'm not anymore, but I still feel like a newbie. Um, I just got a new, a new camera with a new housing and it never even occurred to me that I would ever be able to look at the buttons. So like the very first thing I did was just start working the camera without looking. Um, I'm still making a few mistakes sometimes because the other housing had a few a few setting buttons that were in a slightly different position, so I have hit the wrong button once or twice. But um, in general, then I just I learn it by touch. It never occurred to me to not learn it by touch or to look at it in the first place. But I guess it comes from the the sense that I'm a cave diver who was given a camera, and that's how I started taking photos. It wasn't that I was a photographer and decided to shoot caves. So, like, the very first experience taking a camera underwater was in the cave. So, of course, I'm going to do it by touch. That's the way you're going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess, I guess for, people, for people that are trying out it, I guess what they've got to do is they, it's worth investing your time in, in trying to develop that touch sense on your controls, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people, a lot of people assume that it's going to be like shooting, you know, in a, in a, in a, on a reef, and it's not. You know, it's different, um, sure. Um, uh, as well, I would, I would imagine if they shoot a lot, they probably are looking at their buttons, but I'll bet if they just try and they don't think about it, they could probably do it without looking because they do them all the time, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think I'm pretty good at, at knowing where most of my buttons are, but but I think certainly some of the time, you know, being able, I'd have to lift my head and look at stuff, and that's probably just, that's where it would that's where I'd come unstuck. Um, Obviously, Natalie, we're going to talk about your new camera system in, a, in an episode soon, but um, you're shooting using uh, the LCD or using a, a, an EVF on a mirrorless camera? I have to use the LCD. There's no way I'd be able to do it with the viewfinder. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that obviously, so in terms of composition, you can actually see what's going on through the LCD. Um, yeah, I guess that does make things easier. I mean, that, that certainly may well be a good reason for 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 um, shooting with a with a camera with a better LCD than 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 certainly you know still shooting uh, or sorry shooting in normal, more normal conditions where you might use a viewfinder more for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the LCD I currently have now is so much better than the previous one that you can actually tell when things are in focus on it and stuff now. So yeah. it's usable. That's yeah. really cool. So, so I mean, Natalie, obviously you're you're a, a, a video shooter as well. So, so I mean, obviously videos is, is, is another way of telling the story. And um, how how do you set up moving shots? Presumably, um, you know, you you well, how do you set it up? Uh, let's start with that. So, good, good person. So. <laughs> so we've had conversations about how I want to buy more lights, and this is why is because I. I'm a videographer. This is going to sound really horrible on WebPixel. I would say I have more interest in photos than I used to, but I have almost zero interest in photos. So I started shooting photos as a way to 
practice setting up scenes properly for video because in video, if you have a hot spot, it goes away real fast if you're moving. Yeah, yeah. But uh, in photography, you've got your one shot and you're staring there like, what did I do? So it's really helped me to develop my eye for lighting and movement with this. But I, I, I'm a videographer at heart. Um, so I set up the scenes the same way I do is for photos. That's the whole point of shooting the photos this way. So I use video lights. I don't use strobes on any of my photos. So that's what I do for video. And um, I try to set it up now just like a photo where I'm looking for even lighting. And now I have to anticipate where the model is going to move and make sure I have enough small lights on it that will be somewhat lit, at least so we can see them a little bit through the shot. And then I have to think about my movement and where I'm going to move. And I'll try usually several different movements, but I prefer moving video shots, um, um, even though the video I see you, I'm not moving. Um, so then you have to go and then you have to swim, like the movement you're going to make and make sure now you're not looking at like, is it pretty anymore? You're like, all right, is it going to flash the lens? Is that going to be okay or not? Where do I model in this when I'm moving? Where it's just sort of to block it in your mind. Um, but the thing is, you've got a really limited time to do this. Yeah. So, because, uh, you know, you're underwater in a cave and my lights have 45 minutes of burn time on them on the Keldons. So you have a really limited time. So you have to be fast and you kind of have to accept sometimes when it's not perfect. So I just sometimes try it once or twice, then I just, just move along. Um, and and it's, a, it's a fascinating thing to do, I think, from a videography standpoint. Like if I told a land videographer, all right, you have the camera, like we don't need rigs, you don't need anything. You've got the three-dimensional sense of movement that people spend hundreds of dollars on, or that's right, hundreds of thousands of dollars on for these machines that move the cameras around and make things smooth. Well, I can physically do that holding the camera. So from the idea of these like sweeping or moving shots, it's just such creative freedom that it's, it's highly addicting. <laughs> so, so I mean, that's a, it, it, I, I was going to talk about because obviously camera movement it, traditionally in in, in 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 movie pictures, film, video, whatever you want to call it, you know, the, the goal has always been that the camera stays still um, and the subject moves unless you invest in vast amounts of railways and God knows what to move the camera dollies and knows what to yeah. move the camera smoothly. So do you find that, well, maybe I should ask, how do you get those super smooth shots? I mean, I've seen your shots, they're super smooth, um, like silk. How do you get them so, so smooth? Well, first thing I would say is time in the water. Like, I don't think somebody that doesn't dive as much as I do in the environment that I dive in will be able to get their shots as smooth as I am. It's not study, it's just... I spend, you know, three or four hours a day in caves being absolutely still. Um, and then the second thing that was really good was actually that my first video camera that was given to me was the A7S, which uh, started my love, uh, this obsession with the uh, low light videography because I could. Um, and so this thing doesn't have any stabilization in it at all. Right, so you have to be still if you want to move and swim. You will be still, right? Yeah. Um, so you learn because you have no choice if you want to do this. And so, of course, my first shots were bumpier, and um, I do use stabilization most of the time in post still. Um, but you have to have an extremely stable shot to start, or the stabilization just warps everything behind it. It looks like crap. So you still, I, I still do use some stabilization, uh, but I am getting to the point with the new camera that does have some built-in stabilization that I'm running stabilization because I run stabilization and maybe I don't notice something on my small screen, but it still looks really stable before I yeah, yeah. So do you trim the housing off then, Nat? Do you, do you spend some time get? I mean, obviously you're not diving in a variety of water conditions typically, but but so do you spend some time getting it trimmed off, right? Is it is it nutrient point in the water? Yeah. Actually, when I got off the airplane from Florida after picking up the A7S III, uh, I, I walked, I put my suitcase down next to uh, the rinse tank at my shop and <laughs> assembled the camera and trimmed it before I went upstairs because I was excited, um, but excitingly, the, uh, I had my old camera trimmed properly with uh, these two floats that were perfect for it, and uh, I put the floats on the new camera, 
and it was correct. So the housing is almost exactly the same. Yeah, um, so it took me about 30 seconds to trim the camera. I would say um, I try to trim them so it is very slightly positive, like really slightly. Like if I let go, it'll like slowly, slowly move up. Because then if I want to put it down and clip it to the line, it doesn't hit the floor. And also, interestingly, like when I'm shooting with clients, I'm usually still, you know, I've got like seven or eight lights on me, the camera, and then I'm still running the navigation in the cave. So uh, what you can do then is you put the you put the camera under your chest. Yeah. And then you can do anything, it just floats against you. So it reduces the task without having to clip it off or anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can just like, drop it for a second. And as long as I go for it in about 30 seconds, it's just kind of sitting there next to me in the water, like, good duck, sit. And, yeah, <laughs> stay. Um, and I mean, the other thing about having it slightly positive is, is there's nothing wrong with that little bit of tension, is there? You know, if, when you're holding it, if you've got a little bit of tension, it does help to keep it steady. If it's completely Absolutely. relaxed, it tends to wobble a bit. You just want that little bit of tension. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I tend to find shooting video, I want it just tiny bit positive just so that so, yeah it's just so that it's just i can just feel it in the, in the grips yeah but i'm not fighting it it's important yeah yeah, yeah. also because um then i do do sometimes i mean i'm moving right so i'm in a cave so i have to adjust my buoyancy and like do my personal diving and you know to do two three minute long shots so with my old camera i haven't quite set the new one up yet but i had a strap across the top so i could just put one hand in it yeah. And then like swim it like this. Yeah. You can control quite a bit and like that. So I'm gonna do it to the new camera so I can one hand it again. So you hit record kind of <laughs> you know yeah, where yeah, it's yeah. looking. So you can do it and then you can use your other hand to do everything you need to do. Yeah, I mean I shoot a lot with my eye not on the viewfinder. I think most people assume that you're constantly squinting through a viewfinder or looking at L C D. I once you once you get a grip of once you get on a grip once you get an idea for what, what's in shot actually moving around without your without your your eye on the camera is actually really productive i find yeah i agree so. yeah and that's why i found like the physical sense of having my hand on the camera in the same spot all the time then like i know yeah, uh, yeah. it's like turning yeah. somebody's head to something I mean, they use it. I mean, it's not actually a steady cam, is it? But there is there is a, a type of cam that they use for, for movie production, which pretty much is the same thing, where that you're hanging yeah. the camera on a strap. So it's a very, I mean, it's a similar idea they use on land. Like, obviously, the land ones they haven't got the water buoying it up, so so it's probably a little bit more a little bit more complicated. But yeah, it's a similar idea. Um, I, I was going to talk. I was going to talk. Go sort of go back a minute to lighting, Natalie, because obviously, okay, majority of videographers are balancing ambient light versus artificial light um, and so you know when, when you're shooting video in a, in a, on, a, on a reef you know the idea is that the, the video lighting is there but the viewer is probably not terribly aware of it and that it's just highlighting shadows or so lighting up shadows not highlighting shadows um, and creating that kind of real gentle fill pulling color up a little bit for you, it's completely different. I mean, obviously, you are shooting some some scenes where you've got ambient light, but when you've got no ambient light, you know, you're now in a situation where the whole light source is whatever you've taken with you. How does that affect? So, so I guess the, the question I long long sorry took me a long way to get here, long time to get here. How important is light quality to 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 the the, the image that you're producing? It's absolutely everything. Um... You need really good light quality. So um, I'm currently shooting, I think I said, the Keldons. Um, there's just nothing quite like it that I've seen um, or used. And uh, some of the things that really help are, the, of course, the really high CRI, uh, color rendering index on them. So um, I can do an initial. I always have to adjust because it's going to be different how far I am from the, the model and such. But I can usually eyedropper a tank, which is great, yeah, and great. Uh, and get close to start with a really good color balance just with that. And so, of course, having a better original image is going yeah, to be sure. key in having having a better color. Um, and the lights are really part of that. But the other thing with the Keldons that I think in combination with the dynamic range of the camera I have now is that uh, they have like a really soft fall off because they have the domes. So I've played with some people, like they put diffusers on like big blue lights and stuff, and that'll 
that doesn't it doesn't get you the same effect. It's similar, but the, the drop off is is um, a really big deal having that gentle drop off. Um, and so I think like I mean the first time I tried a sunlight similar to this, I basically just started having nightmares that I couldn't find my Kelvin lights until I purchased some of that two weeks later. Um, it's not an option in my opinion for me. Like. I know a lot of people, if, if, it depends, right? Like, I care about this so much. This is my passion. So I'm going to just do whatever I need to do to get it. I probably have less money than anybody watching this right now. Um, but I still, like, just basically sold a bunch of stuff and bought the telephone lights because it was a, now a life, a life priority for me the moment I tried them. Um, it's, it's everything. The, the light quality is absolutely everything because you don't have sunlight. So... And it's amazing as well, because you can, I'm a control freak, I'm a cave diver. So uh, this is you, like, it's all you. Like, there's no excuses. The sun wasn't at the wrong angle. It wasn't too harsh that day. But at the same point, like, I am the sun. I do what I want. It's down to me. Like, if I want the light on the ceiling or on the floor, it just, it just does it right to me. So, um, so, it's, so an, you, it's an amazing, you have freedom. You got a huge amount of creative options, but also with that, if if you've got to own up to when you don't get it right because it's somebody else's fault. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. Um, thanks, Nat. That's been a lovely chat. We enjoyed it, and I I, I like the idea that um, that you have to sell everything to buy your Keldons. Um, <laughs> um, that's dedication to dedication to the cause. Um, so um, just to recap, um, guys. Um, we Natalie's business is called Under the Jungle, um, based um, in Tulum, in or near Tulum, in uh, in Mexico. Um, it's it's a great place. It's very imaging friendly, um, but also a great place to get out and explore the wonderful Central of Mexico. So so if you're heading that way, um, please go down. You can also check out what's your what's your website address, Matt? Uh, Underthejungle.com. That's nice and straightforward, isn't it? So, but I'll put a link in. We're on Instagram as Under the Jungle. Uh, we'll uh, we'll um, we'll um, put a link in the in the show notes too, so uh, so you'll be able to log on um, and uh, and have a look at that too. So thank you very much, Nat. It's been a pleasure. Um, thank and you so much. I'd like to thank Backscatter Underwater Photo and Video again very much for sponsoring this episode. And um, please head on over to backscatter.com see what they offer. Um, please feel free to add any comments or suggestions in the suggestion box below and drop a like and enjoy it. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again soon.